You're listening to Threads Radio. My name's Luke Fraser, and this is The Tonic.
that's the lead track porphyry of a great little EP by Classical Mechanics, aka Marcus Lancaster, a producer, composer, and singer based in London. It's called Sealand, named after the occupied offshore platform and not quite micronation floating off the Suffolk coast in the North Sea, with a colourful history that takes in everything from piracy through to an attempted mercenary coup and a rebel government in exile. The self-dubbed principality issues its own stamps, currency, titles and passports, even if it has not yet been officially recognised by any sovereign state. The EP was composed using System Mozenzeef, a unique voltage-controlled modular synthesizer and glitch pattern generator created by Ross Fish of Mozenzeef Modular, who also dubs it the world's most useless drum machine. Well, I don't know. It seems to be holding up okay on this record at least. And I do like those noisy, unpitched elements that create a certain atmosphere that points towards the title of the EP. It's a nicely bustling listen with enough melodic tonal content to make it pretty approachable on a first go, but also to reward repeated plays to get some of the many different textures and details wrapped up within it. That's the Sealand EP, and it was released on non-classical earlier this year.
Well, that kind of slaps. That's Sang Awon, a track of the recently released debut album by the Nook Cultural Ensemble, a new project from Nigerian-British drummer Edward Wakili Hick, lately of Sons of Kemet, Steam Down and Kokoroku. It's a collective featuring a host of musicians he's worked with over recent years. At its core is a four-piece drum circle made up of African percussion such as the Ghanaian Panlogu, the tambourine-like Mauritian Ravenne, the Ekwe log drum, and the Gankogwe cowbell. To this core are then added other instruments, from Kishishi shakers to Cajon box drums, Roland drum machines, and so on. The album, Nahi, is named after the Nigerian tie-up word that translates roughly as repair. And the band, in turn, is named after the mysterious Nok culture, which flourished around 1500 BC in what is now Nigeria, and which left behind highly stylized and eerily modernist looking terracotta sculptures that were unearthed in the 1920s. Although their function is still unknown, it's been suggested that they served in funeral rituals, which could explain features such as their detailed hairstyles and prominent jewellery. To our eyes, they look both ancient and strikingly modern, and that serves, I think, as a great metaphor for the Afrofuturist approach of this project. Musically, it's the result of both compositions and extended group improvisations in a process that, in Edward Wakili Hicks' words, celebrates percussion as a complete music. Here's one more off the album.
That was Y-T-T-T, -T -T, or You Telling the Truth. One more cut there off Nahi, the debut album by the Nook Cultural Ensemble, and featuring their flautist and saxophonist Nabia Garcia. The rest of the ensemble are Anome Edgeworth, Joseph Denemonde, Dwayne Kilvington, Theon Cross, Suleiman Latusi87, Zarak Naibea, aka Semelini Jean Baptiste, David Wien, and Angel Bat David. And the album was released on SA Recordings earlier this year.
sounding nothing quite like, well, anything I've heard recently. That's the vocalist Miku Shimizu performing Alfheim, the opening track of young British composer Jasmine Morris's debut Astrophilia, a concept album of sorts drawing inspiration from ancient Viking cosmology. Each movement represents a different landscape from each of the nine mythical realms, and which features a string quartet alongside an array of traditional Viking instruments, which have been subsequently collaged to create the final pieces. Written while she was still studying at RCM in London on a BAME scholarship, it was born out of a process of part composition, part improvisation, part post-production that seems to be becoming an increasingly common form of practice as young composers engage with music making in today's world beyond just the score in real time and with an increasing confidence in using music technology. Some of that is no doubt due to economics and access, but to me it's also a refreshing way of opening up compositional thinking and bringing it into specific, situated and embodied contexts. In as far as it goes, some of the scores behind the pieces on the album were graphic, being based on photographs, and some were text-based. And her approach to post-production is very much based on editing and collaging, creating in her words, sound worlds and sound paintings, rather than employing an effects-based approach. It's a great hybrid way of writing that I'd love to hear more artists exploring. And that piece, Alfheim, is the realm of the light elves that exists in the heavens, and which was the home to those magical bright beings. I love its stark monumental atmosphere that, whilst very different from the other pieces on the album, shares within that sense of being not so much an exercise in historical mimicry or striving for authenticity, but rather an almost otherworldly reimagining of those sounds and instruments in a way that feels altogether more timeless. That album, Astrophilia, was released on non-classical earlier this year. And there'll be one more of that a little later to close out this show.
short and sweet. Well, that is in a sense the name of that movement. Andante, Dolce, part of the Suite for String Trio, written back in 1925 by Emmy Wegener, a Dutch violinist, pianist and poet, alongside being a composer. It's a light and playful five-movement work, hinting at contemporary French Impressionism and backwards in time to movements like Commedia dell'arte, while keeping one foot firmly in the mould of Romanticism. It's taken from an album called Celebrating Women, released last year on Cobra Records and featuring performances by the Hague String Trio. They are Justina Briefes, Violin, Julia Dinnerstein, Viola, and Miriam Kirby, Cello. Thank you. 
lose everything. There's something just unmistakably, well, Dutch about that. It's got something of the attitude and impact of Steve Reich's seminal tape piece come out crossed with the melodic approach to speech samples found in his later piece, Different Trains. It's called Grab It, written in 1999, and it's by Jacob Ter Veltwies, also known as Jacob TV, a self-styled avant pop composer who started out as a rock musician before studying instrumental and electronic music alongside composition at the conservatory in Groningen. It's one of a series of works he's made around chopped and screwed samples of the human voice, and it was originally written for the tenor saxophonist Arno Bornkamp, who you heard playing on that recording. It's since become something of a repertoire piece for sax, and has been rescored now for various other instrumental solos and combinations. It's based on speech samples taken from life sentence prisoners, of which prison and at what period we don't find out, alas. Nevertheless, Jacob describes it as exploring a no man's land between speech and music in the form of a battle between sax and speech. The sax competes with a barrage of syllables, words and one-liners in a real test of performance endurance. There's also a double play or paradox at work. These are the words of prison inmates many of whom I gather are on death row, many of whom may be suicidal. And yet he describes the piece as expressing the idea that in the midst of darkness, life is worth living. Grab it, as he says. There's just something about it. It's got that aforementioned, well, je ne sais quoi, what the term for je ne sais quoi is in Dutch. But anyway, you get the idea. Something about a combination of seeming perennially 80s. Yes, it was written in 99. That's the point and also having that kind of in-your-face directness that is bracing whilst also seeming ever so slightly naff, all expressed through a watertight and often brilliant sense of melodic logic. That was taken from the album Heartbreakers that was put out by Etc. in 2020.
bonkers and brilliant. That's a real slice of electronic music history. Well, three slices actually. Air, Ragtime and Intermezzo, taken from Indo-Dutch composer Henk Badings' 1958 classic ballet suite Evolutionen, or Evolutions. Born in Java, where he was orphaned, he returned later to the Netherlands, though as his remaining family dissuaded him from studying music, he pursued early careers as a mining engineer and then a paleontologist, before deciding to pursue music full-time after all. Nice as rocks and dinosaurs are, music was obviously the thing that he really wanted to do. He went on to amass a gargantuan output in excess of 1,000 compositions. He had a fascination for polytonal and microtonal music, along with unorthodox scales and harmonies, and this seems to have drawn him towards creating electronic music, like Evolutions. Written to accompany the ballet by Yvonne Kyorgi, it was the second of three collaborations between them in which tape music was combined with avant-garde choreography. They must have seemed pretty modernistic, even in the climate of the late 50s, particularly in the context of the ballet world, where they garnered mixed opinions apparently, maybe as they were positioned in a space somewhere between stage performance and installation, and without the familiarity of live musicians, featuring instead a giant rig of speakers mounted on the stage. Yet even in terms of electronic music alone, these pieces were pushing the boundaries. Evolution utilised the entire apparatus of the Philips Physics Laboratory in Eindhoven for its creation. And whilst I'd love to see a staged performance, for the moment we'll have to make do with this recording, reissued back in 2004 on Basta Audio Visuals. It's called Popular Electronics, Early Dutch Electronic Music 1956-63, and features the music of Baddings alongside his contemporary Dick Rodgy makers. And those three central movements you heard there, out of six, they contain some genre based ones and have for me this great quality of being a retro futurist redefining of those stage genres as they were recreated by aliens. And some definite echoes within of similar work being carried out at the time in places like the BBC Radiophonic Workshop by the likes of Daphne Aram and Delia Derbyshire.
That is a real gem that I only chanced across recently. The viola is still so underrated in my view. It's called Morpheus and it was written by Rebecca Clark, a British American composer and violist herself. Most of her work features the instrument. She was something of a virtuoso, building an international performance career and becoming one of the first female professional orchestral players. Her composition output isn't large, but it contains some great pieces within it that show her deftness of touch and depth of poetic expression. Morpheus for me is a real highlight. Named after the Greek god of sleep and dreams, it was written between 1917 and 18, whilst she was pursuing a performing career in the US. With its ethereal harmonies, it shows a close affinity with the language of Debussy, who she was apparently strongly influenced by, along with shades of Ravel and Vaughan Williams. It was premiered in New York in 1918 under the pseudonym of Anthony Trent. Reviewers apparently praised the work by Mr. Trent, whilst largely ignoring the works credited to Clark in her real name that were premiered in the same recital. In another recital, where a sonata of hers tied for first place with a piece by Ernst Bloch, reporters speculated that Rebecca Clark must be a pseudonym for Bloch himself, as the idea that a woman could write such beautiful music was apparently socially inconceivable. Sadly, incidents like these only seem to have strengthened her belief that it was neither the time nor the place for female composers. This lack of encouragement and sometimes outright discouragement also made her reluctant to compose, added to which she had dysthemia, a chronic form of depression. It seems that she didn't consider herself able to balance her personal life with the demands of composition. I can't do it unless it's the first thing I think of every morning when I wake up and the last thing I think of every night before I go to sleep, she wrote. Those of her scores that were published in her lifetime were largely forgotten after she stopped composing. She continued to focus instead on performing. More happily though, scholarship and interest in her work has revived over the past few decades and the Rebecca Clark Society was established in 2000 to promote her music. A 1987 review concluded that it seems astonishing that such splendidly written and deeply moving music should have lain in obscurity all these years. A lesson lies therein. That was performed by the Runya duo. They are Ariana and Diana Bonatesta. The album is Clark Works for Violin and it was released on Avia Classics in 2016.
That's El Divisadero from a quite extraordinary album, Chris Watson's El Tren Fantasma, released in 2011. You may know him as one of the founding members of Cabaret Voltaire. He was with them up until the early 80s. Since when he's been working in experimental music contexts and as a field recordist for TV documentaries. One of those, the BBC's Great Railway Journeys, in its more internationalist guise, featured an episode hosted by TV chef Rick Stein and set on a ghost train which travelled over a now defunct Ferrocarriles Nacional de Mexico line from Los Machis on the northwestern Pacific down to Veracruz on the Atlantic side. In making that documentary, Chris Watson spent a month on board the train alongside some of the last passengers to travel that route. And with this album, the journey of that ghost train is recreated, capturing the atmosphere, the rhythms and the sounds along the tracks of one of Mexico's greatest engineering projects. It sits in a fascinating space between film recording, audio archive, music composition and remix. And it's rare, I think, to hear something that combines these aspects so convincingly. Technically, it has an incredible sense of spatialization and depth. It almost sounds like it was recorded binaurally and can at times even feel like a surround sound experience in its dioramic detail. And it's compositionally satisfying and coherent, bringing together both his skills as a musician and recordist. Yet it also functions poetically, perhaps, as a commentary on the man-made versus the natural. We are not always on the train, and several of the tracks, no pun intended, gah, feature stunning realisation of the surrounding landscape, albeit ominously shadowed by that ghostly presence. Here's a great example of that, Crucero La Jolla.
that has a truly cinematic, even sci-fi quality to it. Just a superb sense of place and the sense of foreboding created by the signal bell announcing that huge hulking machine that we know is coming. That was Crucero La Jolla, which, along with the previous El Divisadero, are taken from Chris Watson's stunning album, El Tren Fantasma, and that was released on Touch in 2011.
Two tracks there. The first was Plunge, the second Drift from British and Sierra Leonean artist Duval Timothy's latest release, Meeting with a Judas Tree. It was recorded between 2019 to 22 across locations including London, Freetown, Sierra Leone, and Spoleto in Umbria, where he was an artist in residence for a project based around Gustav Mahler's Lieder von der Erde, or Song of the Earth. Drift came out of that one, and it was recorded on the piano of Alma Maria Mahler, Gustav's wife. Duval Timothy is a restless and intriguing artist who's been engaged with everything from music, including a production stint for Kendrick Lamar, through textile design and production, children's literature, running a pop-up restaurant, and brewing ginger beer from an old West African family recipe. I also love the fact that he dresses only in blue, and that's apparently to honour the street signs within his home borough of Lewisham. He's got several albums under his belt, many of which feature piano, with his kind of trademark motoric yet melancholy style of minimalism. I've liked them, even if they have sometimes felt a bit like they're retreading familiar territory. But I think it's the prominent use of sound design behind this album, and its integration with piano, that really sets it apart from me. It's an immersive and highly appealing sound palette he conjures up, the piano being both realistically and imagistically reimagined through production that never obscures the sense of the natural environment. It's almost like an electric rendering of it. Recommended in its entirety that one. Performing there, Duval Timothy, Piano and Electronics, and Drift featured Lamin Fofana guesting on production. The album Meeting with a Judas Tree was released on Carrying Colour earlier this year.
the rather lovely and plangent Yoruba Lament there, written in 1955 by Fela Sawande, really the founder, I guess, of a European classical influence style in Nigeria, and probably one of the best known African composers in that style. From Abiyakuta near Lagos, he was the son of Emmanuel Sawande, a priest and pioneer of Nigerian church music. Growing up, he sang in several choirs and studied organ, playing both European classics and working as a band leader, playing jazz, high life, and other popular styles of the day on both piano and Hammond organ. He also studied in London and even formed a piano duo with none other than Fats Waller. From the mid-40s onwards, he was an organist and choir master at the West London Mission of the Methodist Church, and a lot of his organ pieces date from this time. They often feature an incorporation of the Yoruba music that was starting to influence Nigerian church music at the time he was growing up. Yoruban musical styles are often defined by pentatonic melodies and rhythmic patterns underpinned by a dundun, a West African drum that developed alongside the djembe. And these elements he fused with the more explicitly Anglican church style of his upbringing. It's been said that this incorporation was partly to give a special appeal to the black members of his congregation in the early years of migration from Africa and the Caribbean. I certainly find it an interesting mix of what could to Western ears seem quite disparate aesthetic styles, but I guess that the foundation of that mix stems from the history of the Anglican church in Nigeria, which has for a long time been a major cultural presence there. That was performed there by Lucius Weathersby, on the restored 1864 Willis organ at St. Michael and All Angels Church in Great Torrington, Devon. The album Spiritual Fantasy was released on Albany in 2001.
another Yoruba influenced piece there. That was Egun Variations, written sometime in the 50s, I believe, by Ayo Bankwale, a composer and organist himself of Yoruba descent. As with Fela Sawande, he was born into a musical family and grew up within the environment of the Anglican Church. He also studied in London at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama and at Cambridge before moving stateside to study ethnomusicology at UCLA. Later, he returned to Nigeria, working as a producer at the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation and lecturing at the School of African and Asian Studies at the University of Lagos, alongside working as a choral conductor and performer before being brutally murdered alongside his wife at the age of just 41 by a relative. He wrote a lot of liturgical music in the Yoruba language, and his compositions show elements of both traditional Nigerian music and Western classical music, and that's the case with Egon Variations, inspired by an old Yoruba song called Tona Noe. It was beautifully performed there by Rebecca Amordia, and it's taken from her album African Pianism that was released on SOM earlier this year.
a return to Jasmine Morris's Astrophilia album there. That piece was Asgard, the realm of the Aesir, and depicted in Viking cosmology as a celestial city of high towers surrounded by a great wall. It was performed by the Swedish musician Per Rundberg, playing a range of handmade Viking instruments, including cantele, bagpipes, reed, lure, bass jaw harps, nickel harper, the tackle harper wooden flute, willow flute, and cow horn. Okay, I'm assuming some of those are Viking. Did the Vikings even have bagpipes? Answers on the postcard, please. For this piece, she wrote short musical fragments for each instrument and then layered them to create the textures you heard. She said that, I'm really fascinated by folk traditions. It's really important for me to work with these instruments and it's such a shame that we're losing these ancient traditions. We should think about and reflect on where our music comes from, our journey from folk traditions to now. That album, Astrophilia, was released on non-classical earlier this year, and it's worth checking out in its entirety. Okay, that's it from me for now. The Tonic will be back on Wednesday the 22nd of February at, I believe, 1pm GMT. As always though, do check the show's Instagram page for confirmation of that, the underscore tonic underscore. And as always, do drop me a message about anything really via Instagram or via the tonic dot online. Thanks to Rosie, to Freddie, to Lee and everyone at Threads for hosting. It's great to have the station back on air. I'm Luke Fraser. Thanks for listening. <laughs>